Sure. Um, welcome, ev welcome, everyone. Uh, the job of this panel is to answer every single question that appeared on that screen. They got 30 <laughs> seconds uh, for uh, each one. Um, we have an easy time. All we have to do is predict the next 25 years. Uh, I am, uh, even though I'm a Red Sox fan, you probably all know Yogi Berra's wonderful line that predictions are hard, especially when they're about the future. Uh, but we have a perfect panel. The only thing I want to say before we begin, and I will introduce our panel, uh, is that I noticed in this lovely program, uh, the uh, reference to our panel referred to a just city upon a hill. Um, and everybody knows that comes from uh, John Winthrop's uh, famous speech. It was called A Model of Christian Charity, where he referred to a city upon a hill. It's actually very interesting what Winthrop said in that speech. I just wanted to share with you two things he said. Winthrop said, we must delight in each other, make others' conditions our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together, always having before our eyes our community as members of the same body. Sounds like John Winthrop worked for the Ford Foundation. <laughs> um, and he also said about diversity, um, and uh, this will give you a whole new take on the word uh, Puritanism. Um, uh, the, um, uh, John Winthrop said that our differences um, bind us together. He said that um, God created differences so that every man might have need of other, and from hence they might all be knit more nearly together in the bond of brotherly affection. Uh, and so I think Winthrop actually gives us a great way to think about uh, the topic uh, we have here today. We have uh, an extraordinary uh, panel. I'll just go uh, across. Uh, this way we have uh, Governor Deval Patrick of uh, Massachusetts, all politics is local. I asked how he was doing to my dear city and hometown, Fall River, Massachusetts. He said he was doing fine, but I had to lobby him <laughs> right here. He was also uh, Assistant uh, Attorney General for Civil Rights. Uh, Christine Todd Whitman is a former governor of New Jersey, former, uh, the, uh, former head of the Environmental Protection Agency, and present all kinds of things uh, uh, to today. Uh, and then um, Mayor Kwan, uh, Mayor Gene Kwan of uh, Oakland, uh, California, um, who's going to have a lot of things to say to us today about uh, how we can uh, go back uh, by going by, uh, go back to the, the future um, by using high tech means to restore a town hall kind of democracy. And I am looking forward to that. And then my uh, former colleague Isabel Wilkerson of the New York Times. Um, she was the uh, first black journalist to win uh, the Pulitzer Prize, uh, she, or first, uh, first black woman to win the Pulitzer Prize. Thank you. I, I always need help from my friends. Um, and uh, she is the author of a wonderful book. Uh, and um, Governor Patrick was giving it a review, which he will give in the course of this, called The Warmth of Other Suns. It's really an extraordinary book about the migration uh, north with a focus on Governor Patrick's hometown, uh, Chicago. And I did tell him that my first uh, question was going to be, so you're from Chicago, are you a White Sox or a Red Sox fan? Uh, and he gave the excellent politician's answer, I'm a Sox fan. Um, <laughs> so he only lost the Cubs fans in that, but that's not bad. Um, why, don't I, um, why don't I start, well, let's take the large question here and just go around the panel before we begin. 25, looking 25 years ahead, um, what will our cities and metro areas, and that is something we want to talk about, is relationship, changing relationship of cities to metro areas. Um, if we do things right, what might cities in our country look like? And if we do things wrong, what might they look like? If you could talk a little bit about the rights and the wrongs of that. Can I start with start. you? Yeah. Well, EJ, first of all, thank you for moderating. It's marvelous to be with uh, such extraordinary co-panelists and to be here at the Ford Foundation. And thank you to the Ford Foundation for the extraordinary work you do um, and the extraordinary leadership you have. Um, I think when I think about cities 25 years from now, first of all, I'm, I'm nervous as a governor talking about cities because usually, at least at home, if you encroach on a mayor's prerogative, you hear about it in all kinds of ways. Um, but uh, 
I think in looking 25 years forward, I want to look 25 or, four or more years back um, and uh, recall the community I grew up on on the south side of Chicago, which was so beautifully described in, in Isabel's really extraordinary book. Because in the 50s and the 60s, when I grew up there, most of that time on welfare, I lived with my mother and my sister in a two-bedroom tenement. My mother and my sister and my grandparents and various relatives who came in a two-bedroom tenement, and we shared one of those rooms and a set of bunk beds, and you'd go from the top bunk to the bottom bunk to the floor every third night on the floor. Everything was broken. Uh, the sidewalks were broken, the playgrounds were broken, the schools were broken, the families in many respects were broken, but it was a time when every child was under the jurisdiction of every single adult on the block. Every single one. So if you messed up down the street in front of Ms. Jones, she would go upside your head as if you were hers and then call home. So you got it two times. And I think what those adults were trying to get across to us was that they had a stake in us, that that's what a community was. Understanding the stake that each of us has, not just in our own struggles and in our own uh, uh, dreams, but in our neighbors as well, very much, frankly, as, uh, as Governor Winthrop was talking about. So I'm not sure what that city 25 years from now looks like, but I think that that hunger for a sense of community, that we have that stake in each other, must be rebuilt and will be rebuilt in the most successful cities in the future. Uh, Ernie Cortez, as some of you may know from the Industrial Areas Foundation, once said that when he was a kid, his neighborhood was organized as a conspiracy against him. He was talking about all the parents. Um, and he said, we needed more such conspiracies in our uh, society. Um, Governor Whitman, you know, when we talk about this 25 years from now, this vision, uh, it sounds very grand, but uh, you were, uh, we, we exchanged emails, you talked about some easy, straightforward things that can be done actually to enhance this future. So could you give your general vision and maybe talk about sure. some of those well, specific things? First of all, I'll echo uh, our thanks to the Ford Foundation for putting this together and for the work they do in general, having worked with them on a couple of things. It's always impressive. but particularly this and getting people to think in these terms. And I also agree with the governor that if we don't have the public back feeling that sense of community, that they have some ownership over it, that they have some ability to make a change, to affect change, we're not gonna get anywhere. Uh, and I've seen it happen again and again. In Camden, we had enormous issues and problems and I'd see one family on a street trying to hold on to be there. And without a mayor or a council that was backing them, and that effort and helping them, uh, it was very difficult to watch what was going on in those areas because they, they couldn't bring it back and they were trying so hard. But what one of the things that we found early on is part of what defines neighborhoods is their physical aspects, what they look like, um, a sense of community. When you have a stoop, a front stoop, and people sit out outside if they're safe and they sit out outside at night, and they talk to one another, and that's when they can watch what the kids are doing, and that's what they see. So we took a look at what was happening, what we had in place in the state, and one of the first things we found is, for instance, you want a city to be 24-7. You need to have that dynamic going on to keep it really vibrant. We had a policy that actually prohibited that. We did not allow people to live above their stores. So we changed the regulation, did an upstairs downtown, so people could live above the stores that they were managing or owned. And the other thing we looked at is that the codes that we had put in place with all good intent to make everything accessible to everyone was actually causing whole communities to be bulldozed because it was so expensive to try to rehab an existing home to meet the current standards, whether ADA or whatever, that you just bulldozed. You, you didn't bother to try to rebuild. You tore down and again, you lost that whatever was unique in those buildings, those houses, the thing that gave that community its, its individual identity with which, that people really loved and which, with which people identified. And so again, we, we went in and we changed some of those and said there are just gonna be some places that are not gonna be wheelchair accessible. Um, that you're gonna have a front stoop, you're gonna have steps coming up, or that you're gonna have a doorway that's not as wide as what current code would call for. New homes, absolutely, anything new, had to meet those, but a rehab, we wanted to allow rehab so that communities could keep that uh, sense of, of their history. So that again, there was a feeling that there was something here that was bigger than the individuals and gave them a sense that they wanted to keep that. 
and that was a, that was a definition of community. Mayor, I'd love you to talk about two things in terms of this 25-year future. I mean, California is ahead of the nation on many things, and now it's ahead on, shall we say, rather innovative approaches to budgets, i.e. crises. Um, if you could uh, sort of talk about how that fiscal issue, and I love your idea about if we're serious about democracy, we ought to do something about it in some of the experiments you were uh, undertaking in that area. Well, first of all, to answer your overall question, I see cities um, in 25 years still looking into the future what the world will be. If you look at cities like if it's Jersey City or Oakland, where we have 138, 150 languages spoken and that we're hometowns to the world, you, you see what the world is going to be. And the question is, um, and it's the same questions, children who have adequate resources do amazing things and children who have no resources have no hope. And so I live in an, a, a city that most of the country thinks of as being full of crime, being ugly. When Neil Lehrer interviewed me as the first Asian American woman of a major American city, I only had one condition. I said, I want one glimpse of how beautiful the city is. I don't care if it's Lake Merritt or the Redwoods. And I want you to interview me in a neighborhood as a working class neighborhood that's vibrant and not in my worst uh, blighted area, and, and they did both of those. And it's because we have these images of cities and poverty, but they are where America is reinventing itself. And so I'm going back to the future in the sense that I'm taking three of the toughest beats, police beats in my city, which are about the same size as an elementary school district, by the way, and I'm partnering with the superintendent of schools, and I'm gonna to try to make the schools in each of those beats a community center. I'm loading programs into the school center, and I'm knocking door to door. And I have a column that we just put on the Huffington Post, I think, today, where I talked about after six months of just knocking on doors, talking to people, my very first Saturday as mayor, I was knocking on doors, asking people to come out for Martin Luther King Service Day, to come to the opening of a brand new library that I've worked on for over eight years, and to come out to the Crime Prevention Council and to help me catch the people who were dumping seven tons worth of garbage onto their streets that we picked up on Martin Luther King Day. And in those six months, I found that we went from four people at the neighborhood council, which I don't call crime council, I call it a community council where the city comes together with the citizens and we make decisions about that community. We've gone from four to about 18 to 20. We've gone from zero calls on our crime hotline to 103, and I've gone for calls for blight and illegal dumping. I've doubled those from like 500 in a year to 500 already. And so we've made this huge difference in what I would say is grassroots participation and a little hope that maybe there's some change. And most of our initiatives are around kids. So when I walked door to door, we identified 80 families that we put into a Harlem kid zone like Baby College, something that we just funded out of leftover grants because we thought it was important. We didn't think we'd get into the Promise Grant program, but I'm making an investment as a mayor in kids who will not even vote by the time I'm done um, being mayor, but I think that kind of attitude that, that we're investing in the future, we're investing in our children, and we're investing in the toughest neighborhoods is how you make fundamental change in cities. Just keep it to yourself, she had leftover grants. You don't want, sa <laughs> you, you, you don't want Sacramento to take the money away. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm spending it every dime. <laughs> Isabel, you have a very, uh, uh, a really cool way of trying to answer this question. You basically say people answer the 25 year question themselves that migration is a referendum on what people think about the places they're leaving and the places they're going to. Could you talk about that? Yeah, I think that in fact one measure of the success of a city is the fact that it attracts people from all over the country, all over the world, uh, from rural areas or from other cities. And that's in one way that we measure how successful a city is. The most successful and, and desirable cities and places to live often are the places that people are anxious to come into. And what we're now seeing is the 20th century was in some ways about the building up of, of the cities into what we now know. Uh, they were 
were they are in some ways the product of people who were coming in from the South in large numbers and what we call the Great Migration. Um, six million African Americans who went from all parts of the South to all parts of the North and the Midwest and the West. At the same time, that people were coming from all parts of the world, from China and from parts of Europe, uh, Eastern and Southern Europe in particular. And that combination of people has helped create these amazing cities that we have now. What we're now seeing is an out-migration from some of those same cities by some of the children and grandchildren of the very people who had come and populated them to begin with. And every migration is a referendum. It's sending a message somehow. And the question is, are we listening to the messages of the people who are now choosing to leave some of these cities? We're th I'm thinking of clearly Detroit. I'm thinking of Chicago. I'm thinking of New York City, where we are now. And the effect that this is having, what does it mean? Where are they going? We know that many of them are going to the south, southern cities, and they're going to the suburbs. And they're sending a message that we have to listen to. Well, and it's interesting to ask, I want to ask everybody what that message is, because it, it seems to me if you're a public official, um, you face this dynamic of what can you do to promote um, economic development in your area? What can you do in a global economy to make your city shine in some area that will lead your cities uh, or a city that will make it grow? And how do you do that in ways that are consistent with the theme of a just city? Uh, in other words, how do you make this quest, because people are leaving Detroit, say, because the car industry ran into a lot of trouble. Um, there are other reasons, but that's primarily it. So you want your city to be vibrant economically, and you want it to be just. How do you marry those objectives of economic development and social justice, and, and what will that, how will that look over uh, time? Why don't I go to Governor Whitman, and then I'll, just to mix it up a little. Well, I mean, first of all, it's the kind of thing where you can't impose it from the top. You need to involve, particularly from a governor's point of view, you've got to involve not just the mayors and the council, but you've got to involve the citizens of that particular city or town. It's not incompatible to say you're going to have a vibrant city and social justice. In fact, those two things have to go hand in hand. You don't have a vibrant city if you don't have a good quality of life. And that means for everybody. It can't be pockets where you have a good quality of life and pockets where you're not safe going out on the streets or even during the day. Um, it's got to be something that transcends the entire community. And that means, and I think the mayor has spoken to this, and we were talking in, in the back there a bit, and, and talking about how you've got to engage the local community. Uh, one of the things that we did when I was governor is we put in place a community action programs, basically. And um, I didn't do a faith-based initiative. I wouldn't give money to, directly to any religious institution. Wasn't going to go there. But if they put together a community development corporation, because the religious institutions in many of our cities are natural leaders. People go to them. They have comfort in them. They know their community. And we gave them, asked that we, they put together a community development corporation. And then they would come up with what the project was that was going to mean the most to that city whether it was something for seniors or an after-school program for kids. It varied all over the place. But they used the money that we gave them to reinvigorate that city and at the same time provide a quality of life that was equitable for people so that you were addressing everybody's needs. And of course, then you have the bigger issues, and I'm sure we'll all get into that, of if you don't have good, clean air to breathe and good water and things like that, you're not going to have a vibrant community, and, and those are what people were discussing earlier today and the planning aspects of the actual practical, physical aspects of a city. I, I'd like to address it because I've been interviewed quite a lot because Oakland, like many uh, big cities in the country, lost the African-American population. And I often say I'm not quite sure. First of all, they're not doing the undercount. So Oakland actually um, used to be always the, the, one of the cities that got the undercount. And so I'm not sure if I lost population. But I do, do know the demographics have shifted. But they make sense for the West Coast. The more Asian and Latinos are moving into California. They have bigger families. But also there's opportunity for African Americans for the first time. Oakland's one of those cities that may be considered impoverished by many people, but it has some of the best housing stock and is a place where the prices of homes just went up astronomically. And that for a lot of young people that I helped 
get through high school and then through college and even are working for the city and then bought their houses in Tracy two hours away because that's where they could afford a house. Uh, on the other hand, there is clearly some gentrification. There are people moving over from San Francisco who are more affluent. There are there's this great migration of affluent seniors who are moving back to cities because cities are a much more fun place to age in place. You know, you can use mass transportation. Our kids will eventually take away car keys, even from Californians, and you know, we'll, we'll have to take public transportation. And there are That's more a solution to global warming. <laughs> there are more things to do in Oakland on any one day than there are some of my nearby cities in a whole month. So um, you see that, and I think the question is how. How do I make sure that I have a workforce housing? How do I have diverse housing for rich, poor, wealthy, um, everybody? Because I did 220 house parties. Everybody said they came to Oakland because of its diversity. And they didn't mean just the shades of our skin. They liked the different neighborhoods. They liked that we politically disagree with each other. And more importantly, as my daughter would say, it's a real city. It has all sorts of people. It has rich people, it has poor people, it has regular working people, it has boring professionals, as she would say. It has all sorts <laughs> of people. And it's a real city, and you feel like you live in a real city, and it has what our family calls that buzz, that cultural combination of, of innovation and arts and culture, which we haven't talked that much about today. I actually think people come to cities because of the great arts and culture and the great gumball of ideas that happen in cities. Thank you. Governor? Well, I was thinking, um, as you were asking the question and listening to my colleagues here on the, on the panel, that um, our growth strategy for the state, which has emphasized education, innovation, and infrastructure, and of course, the statewide has a special concentration in cities by virtue of the number of people and the number of jobs. Um, we're getting traction. We're growing jobs faster than 46 other states where kids are number one in student achievement, uh, we're number one in health care, we emphasize those industries that uh, depend on the concentration of brain power in the well-educated uh, workforce and infrastructure is the unglamorous work of governing but it's been neglected for a long, long time. And frankly, if you don't have an adequate public transit system uh, and a safe uh, road system, then all bets are off for almost anything else, let alone broadband and other kinds of infrastructure. But one of the things, and we're seeing, by the way, to the migration point, for the first time in 20 years, young people and families are moving into Massachusetts faster than they're moving out. But just yesterday, we had uh, a group of financial services leaders, that's a big sector in, uh, in the greater Boston area, in the governor's office, and they were saying it's getting to the point where it's hard for them to imagine a new employee living in the city of Boston who makes less than $100,000. Now, um, you know, sometimes in Boston we point to New York. Well, I won't say all the reasons why we point to New York, but, uh, <laughs> but sometimes. You're some, a guest, you know. <laughs> well, I used to live here, uh, but sometimes, and my wife's from here, but sometimes we point to New York, to New York City, and we say, how come they figured out how to have, to the mayor's point, a range of incomes and a range of housing, um, and we haven't quite figured out how to have that intentionally. We have it circumstantially, but I mean intentionally, meaning we have uh, corners of, of our communities where poor people have lived and immigrants have lived for generations. They just change the complexion and the place they came from. But they, and you know what I'm talking about, EJ, everything from the North End to, uh, to Mattapan, I live across the line in, in Milton. Mattapan was where um, uh, Eastern European Jews lived for a while and then uh, and then African Americans moved in and, and the Eastern European Jews moved across the line to, Mass to Milton and further south and out west and then uh, uh, folks from Cape Verde and, uh, and so it's just a, but how do we have um, a, 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 a true mixed income, mixed, um, how do we live integrated lives, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and enable that um, in terms of how we, uh, how we invest. Thinking about people leaving cities. You know, when I was growing up on the south side of Chicago, we had very middle class ambitions, right? Pretensions even. And our idea of success was to get a house in the suburbs. And that's what we did if we could. And interestingly, the folks who fled us um, to the suburbs 
are moving back <laughs> into the city. So I, I am very interested in the question you raised backstage, Isabel, and, uh, and again here, about what the migration says. And I think implied in that is who's migrating and where? Um, uh, and I, I don't have all those, uh, uh, those answers, but I, I, it sort of makes me wish I was sitting out there rather than, <laughs> rather than up here so I could sit and reflect on what I'm hearing instead of responding to it. Thank you. I want to say, by the way, Governor Patrick used to work at the Ford Foundation. I was right? on the board here. Yes. On the board here. Yeah, so he, your, his entire term in office can be seen as a test of all the ideas ever put forward Pretty by much. Uh, the Ford Foundation. <laughs> That's um, why we're on the fly. Uh, they, <laughs> Isabel. <laughs> Do you, what's you, what is your sense on this uh, question? How do, you, how do you make a place a magnet and so, secure social justice at the same time? Well, I think one, one of the issues has to do with uh, segregation and, and what's called hyper-segregation in some of the cities that ultimately became the receiving stations of the Great Migration. Uh, Chicago is one of them. Uh, Cleveland, many of these cities ended up becoming hyper-segregated because of the movement, the multiple migrations, the, the uh, resulting migrations that occurred with Within the borders of these cities as, as African Americans came in uh, essentially inheriting the places that had been uh, the, the homes of, of Eastern Europeans, Lithuanians, or whoever had preceded them, and moving forward and forward. And as those people, as you had said, uh, Governor, uh, had uh, gone out to the suburbs, which they then became the American dream. How do we pull back what is the definition of the American dream and remind people that what drew everyone was the city in the first place? That the suburbs, in fact, that have become uh, in a way, a replacement for the American dream. The cities are what are the, the, the mainstay, the, the, the foundation. No suburb actually can even exist truly without the strength of the city. That's why we worry about what happens in Detroit, while we worry about what's happening in the depopulation of other cities. It matters when people are not in those central cities. When it comes to the culture, when it comes to uh, the, uh, the range of, of ideas that come with the new influx of people, all of that is what makes a great city. And so getting back to the 25 years from now, one would hope that each of these cities would then be able to draw upon the strengths that are there already. One of the things that I find most in, uh, inspiring in a way, um, which takes me back to growing up in Washington, D.C., uh, where I grew up in a segregated neighborhood in Washington, D.C., a quiet neighborhood, a middle class uh, neighborhood of people who had worked for the government, the people, the invisible people that make the government work. And, uh, but it was uh, quietly segregated. And over time, that neighborhood has changed as, uh, it, it's almost unimaginable. It had been completely surrendered by people who had been, uh, who were white and had moved out in the suburbs, and now their children and grandchildren are moving back into neighborhoods that people would have been perhaps uh, concerned about whether they would even drive through. And uh, the reason for that is because, in some ways, the, the price of gas, the, the uh, desire to be closer to work, the, the, the recognition that you're losing hours and years off your life in commuting, that is the strength. The location alone of cities is its own strength. And then on top of that, the, the architecture. People are embracing the, the architecture of the cities, which can, can never really be competed against when you look at the newer places in the suburbs. Not to say anything against them, but the, the lofts that are being made out of abandoned factories, the old row houses in Washington, D.C., the brownstones in Harlem, which are now being reclaimed by the children and the grandchildren of the people who had left before. And I find uh, great inspiration from a recognition that we really, truly have come a long way. Um, my, the house that I grew up in was uh, sold to, uh, to uh, yuppies, uh, which, is a, <laughs> which is code. Uh, un unimaginable, unimaginable 30 years ago. And uh, I don't know what that means. There's a lot of questioning as to whether gentrification is a good thing or a bad thing. I believe it is a thing. <laughs> and I believe that it is natural. And Are you sure you're not the politician here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe that essentially, I, I truly believe in the, the primacy of the human heart. 
Human beings will do what they feel is necessary in order to raise their families and to have a good wage in order to be able to do that and to get their kids in the best schools that they can afford. They will do whatever it takes. They will go as far as it takes. And I think that there's a lot to be learned from what is it that they're choosing to do and figuring out that. I think that it means that we're all in some ways followers of what the individuals are doing. We, are fo we follow the great migration. We're following this current migration. Where are they telling us uh, the uh, energy is and should be. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Please. No, go ahead. Well, I was I just wanted to. Um, there's some policy implications that uh, I think uh, I, I know that Governor Whitman pursued when she was uh, when she was governor, and certainly we're uh, pursuing that. I think about as a relatively new uh, politician that come from uh, some of the points you made, and that's how we. It's a custom in politics to to. Um, uh, to make judgments in silos, in public policy, I should say. You know, this notion that we should just be, you know, we've got our housing policy over here, we've got our transportation policy over here, we have our public art policy uh, over here, our education policy over here, when in fact people lead intertwined and integrated lives. And so what we, you've heard this term, transit-oriented development or smart growth, that um, when you're trying to um, reclaim a community in a, in a city, it can't just be about the, Small business lending you're uh, you're doing it also has to be about the uh, about the transportation opportunities, the housing, as you said, above the store uh, kinds of things. The, the what you do in the schools, what you do to make the community physically uh, attractive, and all of that has to come to bear at once. Which for us has meant a very kind of um, intentional uh, movement from community to community rather than taking a given policy and trying to spread it all out across every place at once because we just can't. We just can't do that. I was gonna, actually, we governor's minds move work alike or something because I was th particularly thinking along those lines because you have this this issue where leadership clearly matters and governors can do a lot to help create an atmosphere that allows for cities to grow. And as I mentioned earlier, one is looking at what our policies are. But there's a, a thing now, Smart Growth America started, and it's, it's been expanded, called the Governor's Institutes. And we just did one in New Jersey. I was there for that, where it's a two-day forum. They ask the governor to participate for at least part of it. Uh, they bring all the cabinet members together so that every cabinet member is part of looking at where do you want to take this state? Where do you want the state to be in 25 years? What do you want it to look like? And how are we going to integrate the policies between the De Department of Environmental Protection and the Department of Community Affairs so that they're harmonized so we can do this? Because the danger, and we've seen it, and Newark, to me, is an example of part of the problem when you, when you still think in silos, because the, the great idea, and it's, there's merit to it, you wanted a 24-7 city. So we put a performing arts center in there that is extraordinarily beautiful, and it's great acoustics. It's a wonderful center. We've got a baseball team there now, as well as the rock for my devils. Um, you know, you, we've, we've got Rutgers putting more housing in there none of it's worked. It hasn't worked yet, and I think part of that problem, at least the earlier parts, was because the communities weren't brought in. And the thinking wasn't as a whole. It was more, again, continuously in those silos. Because the Performing Arts Center, again, has wonderful things in it. It brings people in. There are all sorts of great restaurants around there, but very few people who come in to go to the Performing Arts Center walk around the city to, to find those good restaurants. And it's, we, we've missed a beat in there. We've missed a step somewhere along in the planning. We haven't involved everybody to the point where we can make this a seamless transition. I want to. If I could just add on to that then. So. Pick a fight with the governors. So, I've so, wanted so. to have a well, you know, mayor governor <laughs> fights are great, you know? Yeah. Actually, these are great governors, so it's hard to <laughs> pick a fight. I, that's why I go, when people, when foundations, I, I had a chance in my first month to meet with a, uh, about a dozen Bay Area foundations, small ones. They didn't have the kind of money Ford Foundation has. But they asked me, what did I want? And I actually said I wanted two things. I wanted um, some coordinators at the school district because I planned to recruit 2,000 volunteers to work with the city's toughest kids. That is the 500 kids we arrest every year, the 300 kids uh, uh, aging out of foster care and the 1,200 kids who are chronically absent. I wanted to introduce the community to its children and I needed 
more people to help process the volunteers so that, that people will get to know its city's children and not be afraid of them. The second thing I wanted was community organizers because um, I don't have a, a title of that in my city bureaucracy, but I'm going to create one. I need people who go out and connect the city with the community and get the community involved. In these times when we don't have enough money, I can't have enough police, I can't have enough street cleaners. The community really <laughs> has to be involved and take ownership of those neighborhoods. And so that's, to me, just old-fashioned organizing. I wouldn't be mayor today. I faced somebody who spent me by two million if I hadn't had a thousand volunteers. Barack Obama, we couldn't even pronounce his name when he declared, most of us across the country. But he had this massive movement of volunteers uh, um, that I saw in my city, just people who packed up and went to Ohio and Nevada and whatever. There is an energy, I think, in the country that are willing to do um, and focus on change. And I think the fight for democracy and the fight for civil rights is going to be in the cities. And sometimes it's even mobilizing people in the cities. I told a story earlier to one of you that I have very affluent African Americans who live above the Warren Freeway who will not go to East Oakland. And they think, I'm crazy for doing it. Um, we have to break down the silos within our community and not just in our agencies. It's why, um, but in our agencies, it's an opportunity. Oakland has this unique partnership of city, schools, and county leaders that meet all the time. It's why I'm adopting the schools and moving my services into the schools. It's an opportunity to do things different. You know, like crisis is a horrible thing to waste is what Ram says. Well, um, the Chinese would say in, in the character of crisis is both opportunity and danger. So we need to use the opportunity. I'm so tempted to say, how's Ram doing? But I won't take us there. <laughs> I want to um, I want to ask a sort of a, a paired question, really. Um, the w w cities and suburbs don't have the same relationship today that they did 30 years ago. Um, my friend Bruce Katz from Brookings, where colleagues, I don't know if Bruce is here, but this is sort of the gospel according to Katz, as many of you uh, know, or at least Bruce is one of the first people to know, start talking about this, um, that uh, a lot of suburban areas now resemble cities in their ethnic diversity, in some of the problems they have, they're in the uh, complicated class structures that they have. There aren't, there aren't sort of, um, they're, they're not neighborhoods of the purely affluent or purely middle class. Uh, which creates some real opportunities in terms of cooperation across metropolitan lines uh, that didn't exist before. So I wanted you to talk about that, and I thought Governor Mayor perspective on that would be uh, particularly interested, and your migration perspective also would be particularly interesting. The other thing I'd like you to talk about in relationship to that is um, cities are now not just competing against each other within nations. I mean, we have uh, this whole phenomenon, as that video suggested, of you know, uh, you know, New York is competing with London and you know, be and Beijing or Shanghai, more more likely, uh, and so on, and how that fits together. Because for somebody looking on the outside of New York, yes, most people think of it as Manhattan when, in fact, it's five boroughs. But looking on the outside, people are looking at the whole area that is New York or greater Boston, which actually has a very small population relative to the metro area. So if you could talk about the, the whole metropolitan uh, question and how that bears on what these what cities look like in 25 years. Um, who wants to start with that? Yeah. Let, let me start. Um, Oakland has become known for our regional festivals, and I was telling um, several people here that we have this festival at the end of August called Art and Soul. And I usually leaflet those concerts, and I had expected to find mostly Oaklanders. And what I found is that all the African Americans in Northern California seemed to be in town that weekend. And many of them had roots in Oakland. And so I really realized that the city was a cultural center. And I hope at least you got contributions out of it, if not votes. No, but no. they <laughs> stayed in my hotels. I got hotel tax. You know, you, you, know, you, you, you think about that. You know, and I'm, I'm trying to encourage that. But I realized how important Oakland was as this regional center. And I'm one of the few big city mayors who actually will go to the Association Bay Area Governments, our regional thing, and I'll sit on the League of 
cities with the small and suburban because I believe I need all the friends I can get. And what I find, and when I was the chair of the Urban uh, Coalition of Boards of Education, I found that actually as a big city mayor, I usually also was speaking for the really poor rural uh, minority groups also, and that many of our issues were the same because there is high poverty in California's poor rural cities, and they don't have the clout that I have. And in many ways, they have been my allies in fights in the state level. And um, when Jerry Brown and I have our little famous discussion, since he was our former mayor and he's my constituent, um, I can run into them at a local restaurant. Uh, we talk about how what's good for poor kids in Oakland is, are good, is good for poor kids wherever they are at. And that I need him to, and I need local and federal officials to stop treating funds like peanut butter and put the money with the poorest kids and into the poorest neighborhoods and to prove that democracy works for everybody. On the international level, I have to tell you, if someone had told me that I was going to be famous in China and that I'd have a foreign policy when I was running for mayor a year ago, I wouldn't have believed it. But my first congratulations came from people who are living in Shanghai and Beijing because the announcement was made 6 o'clock at night, hadn't even run into the, the US papers yet, but it was front line headlines in Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Beijing, because I'm the first Chinese American mayor of a major American city. And um, I am now helping Obama meet his import goal of doubling uh, exports, uh, because Oakland is the only port that exports more than imports. And I'm more likely to get investments from a Chinese developer in some of these tougher parts of Oakland than I am from American investors. And that's the global economy, that I'm, I am showing a lot of Chinese investors tough parts of East Oakland near the Coliseum. And I'm thinking I'm more likely to get money from them than I might from a traditional bank. Wow. Um, yeah. Speaking to the, the cat's doctrine on uh, <laughs> the changing of the suburbs, uh, I, I have two two observations on that. Uh, first of all, the uh, what's happening in terms of migratory patterns is if you look at Chicago, for example, the migration out of the cities tends to be in the same direction of where the people, particularly African Americans, happen to be to begin with. To begin with. So often the primary migration would be to the south in Chicago. In Washington, D.C., it's to the east, to PG County. And so in some ways, it, it helps. To, it, it's a kind of mainstreaming on some level as they have the right to and are seeking the American dream in places that seem to be more uh, affordable for them. The, uh, the, and, and then in some ways that can be a downside because that's in some ways continuing a, a, an older pattern of, of segregation. The upside of that though is that there's a much greater diversity in the suburbs than in, in, uh, in terms of class than we might have had before. And that actually is a good thing. Maybe not from, I'm not a politician so I don't have to worry about votes, um, but I I think humanistically speaking, it is good or it's probably so much better when people have the opportunity to feel that they're in the same boat, that they have things in common that they might not have seen before. It helps to cut down on the city versus suburb paradigm, which is so much easier to have if you have race and class as the division, the dividing line between suburb and city. And I think that having the uh, having the suburbs look more like the city actually can be probably a good thing overall in the longer scheme of things 25 years out than to have the bifurcation that we've seen for so long. Um, well, one of the things that, that I, we've seen, and I'm sure you've seen it too, is there is a resistance to, to melding the two. Uh, in Camden, we put a light rail in. When we opened it up, the New York Times accused me of the biggest boondoggle since the Teapot Dome scandal. And it was because none of the communities south of Camden wanted this rail line because they said all the crime from Camden's got. Now, I mean, how many robbers stop for get the train in the schedule? <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, they've got to wait and get out. It was ridiculous, but there was enormous They're pushback. They're energy conscious, you know? They're <laughs> there was enormous pushback. Now that rail line is full. What's happened is that the uh, suburbs along the line, the businesses, the property values have gone up. The businesses are doing more business, but the pushback initially was enormous. I mean, they, people, we don't want this because it's going to bring only the bad in with it. And in fact, the opposite was just the case. Bad didn't go, good did come. And that's a question again of, of articulating the possibilities and of leadership taking it on. I, I was, you're right that we're sharing a brain here because um, <laughs> I, I was thinking the same thing. We have. 
We have 351 cities and towns in, in Massachusetts, and you know this, EJ, from your own experience. They are fierce about their independence. You know, each town has its own delicious New England center, its own town hall, its own the rest of it. And, um, uh, and I was looking uh, a couple years ago at 911 centers. Uh, I think the state of California has four. We have 216 <laughs> 911 centers. The notion of trying to plan um, a lot of infrastructure, for a train, for example, you can't do that town by town. You have to do it regionally. And more and more, what we are trying to do is encourage this regional behavior with a city or metropolitan center as that economic hub. In our case, the gateway cities, like your hometown of Fall River, have always served or had served that, uh, that role traditionally. And some investment there um, uh, helps. The example that uh, I think um, uh, sort of crystallizes what a challenge this has been for me at home is very like yours, uh, Governor. We have, uh, we've got a, a, a subway system, which is the oldest in the, in the country in, in the greater Boston area. And we have commuter rail. The commuter rail zips right through the inner city neighborhoods and stops downtown. And the uh, communities have been saying, we need more subway extensions out to our uh, neighbors. We don't have money for new subway lines, but we do have money for platforms along those uh, commuter rail uh, lines where we could open the, you know, stop the train, open the door, and charge a subway fare for someone to get a ride down, uh, downtown where the jobs are more often than not. You would not believe the blow black, the blow, excuse me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you would not believe the response. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's going to happen, and it's, and it's going to happen for the same reasons the governor, the governor said. It's good for everybody. And every place the train has ever stopped has been economically vital. Thank you very much. Now, I've gotten two signs from the good people organizing this. One said, no Q&A. I think that meant that I blew the other sign that told me I should have moved to Q&A. And now I'm being told to wrap up. But I am a, I am a small d Democrat. I hate the idea we'd have a whole panel without a single question from the audience if that were my fault. So does somebody want to ask one final, very forward-looking question. Remember, 25 years uh, from now. Uh, there you go. I feel terribly uh, uh, lucky here. My, I'm Gene privilege, Bonnell. a high privilege. Gene Bonnell at the University of Albany. I teach urban and regional planning, very interested in everything. One of the things that hasn't been discussed and that is different about American, the American cult context that makes it different than in Europe and other parts of the world is that we have a system of state and local finance that creates very uneven playing fields, resource bases, costs. And one of the aspects, the troubling aspects, I think very unjust aspect of living in metropolitan America is that people in some communities get very good services and actually pay relatively low tax rates and, and it all feeds into higher property values so they are enriched, They're, the properties they own uh, become more valuable and they end up being winners and the other people are living in places with very high property taxes, high property tax rates, which depresses property values, um, erodes the revenue base of the municipalities so they don't provide good services. So you're paying a lot, you're not getting a lot, and you're losing money, and you can't sell your house for what you had. And this is a problem across New York State in our, in our regions, all of our, except for New York City, which is uh, a whole special case, but all our upstate cities are experiencing that. And, it, it goes to the question of the point of migration. Why do people migrate? Well, one of the reasons is they're acting rationally. They're moving to a place where they're not going to, where their investment in their home is going to be better, where their taxes are going to be relatively lower or lower percentage of their housing costs, and they're going to get better services. And so, I mean, I think one of the things that's been lacking in this is the whole issue of state and local finance, and the and the possible, um, you know, remedy. In of tax base sharing, you know, for example, in a metropolitan scheme, which hasn't been repeated, other than in the Twin Cities, but it's it's really one of the structural reasons why people move, and I think, and why we it's difficult to reinvigorate our urban centers. May I, do you mind if I just ask a question? 
Okay, the, we're just, uh, we're, yeah, we're, we're supposed to wrap up, but go ahead. You want to ask him a question? Do you want to ask the gentleman a question? Of By the way, this proved I should have gone to this audience a whole lot earlier. That was a great question, sir. What's your question? Is, are you saying that, um, that the solution, Professor, that, that you're looking for is a, uh, is a way to spread the tax, uh, the tax base, or the, particularly property tax, metropolitan-wide? Uh, the sharing of, in the, in the Twin Cities, it's a sharing it's a sharing of the of non-residential tax base. It could be broadened to include the distribution of tax revenues from homes that are maybe over a half a million dollars. Or uh, Myron Orfield has put these ideas on the table. It it relates to major developments that uh, malls and uh, right. we have a, a a chip fab plant that is being built in the town of Malta, right. uh, outside of Albany, right. rather than Schenectady or Albany, $101.2 billion of state money is going, and the property tax revenue is going to go to the town of Malta. The impacts are going to be regional on other communities right. and traffic and everything else. Right. 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 Why don't we, use, thank you, that's a great question. Why don't you, anyone wants to respond to that and offer some closing comments? A, a single or multiple set of predictions about 25 years, uh, but I think what you said just is flatly true. I appreciate what you said. Why don't we, uh, let's see, how did I, I started with you, Governor. Why don't I start with Isabel and work the other way? Well, I, I, when I look at uh, where we are right now and where we'd hope to be, I look to cities such as Detroit. Um, that's one of the places, one of the first places that I worked as a national correspondent at the New York Times. And that's a city that's clearly been in crisis. It's one of the great cities of America. Um, it has a great connection clearly to the Ford Foundation. And uh, it's, it's been, uh, it, in some ways, it's a laboratory for what can go well and what cannot go well in a major American city. And I really truly believe the, the moral imperative for us as Americans is to see, see that we really can't be whole if a place like Detroit cannot be whole. I feel that in some ways if we, uh, whatever happens in Detroit is in some ways uh, a commentary on what we as Americans and what this democracy, what this economy can and cannot do. Parts of Detroit are essentially, have returned almost to, uh, to prairie. And, uh, and yet there are people who are still staying there and struggling and trying to make this place work. And I believe that obviously places like that need tremendous amount of help, but I think that a lot of it has to come up from the ground and they're sending us a message that each day there are, there are hundreds and hundreds of people who are leaving that city. And so much of what we're talking about has to do with what will Detroit look like, for example, in 25 years. I would hope that it could rise from where it is and perhaps be stronger as a result of what it's been through. Thank you. Mayor. Well, since I have an international policy now and I realize that I'm competing against young people and cities in China, um, I recently came back from a, a quick trip to try to get some investment. And I went to Shenzhen, which is where all our iPhones and iPads are made. It, that was just a little fishing village when I was one of the first Chinese Americans into China. And they built one city and now two cities. Um, and they're beautiful, it's a beautiful city, wide streets, good planning, lots of green space, and all of that. And they did that in, in 10 years, right? So the, the, the pace of change in the world is happening very quickly. And we're so proud of our system and our innovation, but innovation's happening in the city. So I'm just gonna end with this quote from the CEO of Pandora at my very first speech in front of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, he got to speak, thank goodness, before me, and um, I'd, I'd been given two days notice I was gonna give the keynote. Um, and he said, you know, I came to Oakland because your rents were cheaper, but now I know I could only be in Oakland because the kind of people who makes my business work um, love the diversity. Young workers are green. They have to ride their bike to work. And they love the art and culture that's organic to the city. And what he's basically saying is, and I think this is true with young people, when I was campaigning, for older people it was crime and jobs, for parents it was schools and public safety, but for young people, um, and some people were complaining about raising parking tickets, they said, 
no, you should raise it more. We need more public transportation. And that was their main issue. We have to worry about the global, not just the global economy, but whether or not our children will have a place. They cared about global warming. And it reminded me of when I was a kid and was told to duck behind underneath the desk because we thought we were going to blow up the world. Well, now we may just fry the world. Um, <laughs> but, but it's clear that young people are in a different place and that they're bigger innovators and the movements around the world are now in the cloud or online. We have to tap that energy and the cities are where these ideas come together and they are our best asset and we need to invest in them and that means we need to invest in every child in them. I'm, I'm very basic. If I can give kids a decent education, then everything else will follow. Crime will go down. Businesses will move to my city, and um, we'll all be a lot happier. Well, to the, the professor's point, the redistribution of, of wealth, of tax base, can only really take place at the state level. Um, and that already does in different states in different ways, whether it's through education grants or other programs and municipal aid and things to, to the cities to help them be able to, to keep their tax base down. But, you know, there's a vast difference for me that the city of the future, what's possible and what's probable. And the most that I hope for, I mean, I can envision the kind of city that you see in, in Nusongdo in South Korea, which is a city next to Incheon, but it's a separate city, but it's a suburb, and it's all green, and it will be, hopefully, the first lead neighborhood development city in Southeast Asia. But until we embrace something that we feel very strongly about in New Jersey, that we are many faces but one family, uh, we're not going to really, I think, grasp the challenge that's in front of us or the thing that will truly make us great. Because in this country, it's our diversity that gives us depth, that gives us strength, it gives us the kind of brain power, thinking, and different perspectives that enables us to come up with the answers that will actually solve problems. And we need to start there, frankly. Lovely. Well, these, are, these are all fabulous last words. I, 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 I guess I was thinking that in many respects today, the American dream is up for grabs. That the things that have um, defined us and distinguished us as a, as a country, that one generation mobility, um, your ability to move yourself and your family to a different place, is in real terms and in the American imagination really up for grabs today. Cities have to be a part of the revival of the American dream. And our willingness to see government as having a role in that revival, a respected, appropriate role in that revival, uh, uh, has to be um, uh, honored. I'm a capitalist, but I'm not a market fundamentalist. I don't think the market always gets it just right if left on its own. And I think that this notion that we, whatever the tax mechanism, um, but the notion that there are worthy investments that government makes in order to create the kind of opportunity um, and the kind of community, whether that's a city or a smaller version of that, um, is a worthy uh, thing, I think is something that we ought to be saying, uh, we ought to be celebrating more, calling more attention to, and frankly fighting for. Thank you so much. I, I want to put in five seconds on the good gentleman's question. We, my family lives in Bethesda, Maryland. We moved there because they have excellent public schools. And I always tell my friends who support vouchers that we do have vouchers in America, but they are distributed by real estate agents. And there's, uh, you know, and it goes to your point. My favorite quotation, I think, on politics is from the philosopher Mike Sandel. Some of you may know Mike's work. Um, he said, when politics goes well, we can know a good in common that we cannot know alone. And I think one of the great things about thinking about cities is they remind us that we have to tend to the commons. It's no accident it's called Boston uh, Common, to common things, to common interests, to the common good. I want to salute Ford for caring about those things. And I want to salute Governor Patrick, Governor Whitman, Mayor Kwan, and Isabel Wilkerson for helping us think about them today. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs> Yes. Well, please uh, join me in not only in thanking our panel here who closed out today, but all the incredible panelists and moderators we've had throughout the whole day.
We also want to thank you for the time you've given us and, uh, and the inspiration that you've given us. Um, one of the things that all of our panelists asked us when we were talking to them about this day was, what did we hope to accomplish from this day? And we said, really, we wanted to do three things. We wanted to remind you that one does not chase prosperity without attending to justice, to social equity. And if you try a shortcut like that, you don't get to sustainable cities. The other thing we wanted to do, we wanted to inspire you with examples of people who are doing incredible work on the ground and show you that our vision of the just city isn't a fantasy, it's something that can happen if we make the right choices now. And the third thing we wanted to do was to motivate you to take action. And we wanted you to do the things that need to be done in the next 10 years, the next 25 years, to make the society that we know is possible a, a reality. And so, um, Donna, uh, we would also like to thank all the people who helped to put this together. Don, please. Yes, uh, we would just like to thank our staff and the wonderful team that worked tirelessly behind the scenes to put this event together for all of us. So, thank you, all of you. And now... And now, you all deserve a drink. <laughs> and because we're the Food, food Foundation, we have food to go with that drink. Please join us in the atrium. and. Uh, do what you do best, which is talk to each other. <laughs> Thanks.